Next on Unsolved Mysteries. The disappearance of a college student baffles police. The truth may rest with a mysterious blonde woman or in the missing pages of a secret diary or perhaps with the student herself. Someone knows who attacked a 16-year-old girl, leaving her in a coma for three months. Investigators believe that threats may have silenced potential witnesses. A man poisons his estranged wife with a lethal cocktail. He was captured twice, but he's still on the run. And a quiet loner dies, leaving behind savings of more than $200,000. And maybe you are one of his heirs. There is nothing like a good mystery. And you know what? They're even better when they're true. I'm Dennis Farina. Join me for an hour of Unsolved Mysteries. Rochester, New York. Will you come back here? I have to go to work with half this conversation. After five years of emotional and physical abuse, 27-year-old June Maloney was done. She finally walked out on her husband, Joseph. Of course, what about the kids? Joe and June agreed on an informal separation. June would take custody of their two young children. Joe was allowed to visit whenever he wanted. June confided in me that Joe had roughed her up a couple of times. He didn't hit her, she wasn't bruised, but he wasn't above jumping around, hollering and yelling and looking very dangerous and perhaps grabbing hold of him and shaking him. Neil, suppose I wanted to kill a dog. <laughs> what kind of poison could I use that couldn't... Several be weeks after June moved out, well, Joe well, paid well, Neil well. Dunkelberg a visit. Neil experimented with chemistry as a hobby and had a lab in the basement of his mother's home. The trouble is they're very difficult to calibrate. He told me that there was a dog who was continuously tipping over his garbage cans and giving him fits. And he would like to poison the dog, but he was a little shaky about doing this because it belonged to a policeman that lived in his neighborhood. Joe showed interest in one particular chemical, a clear liquid which is odorless, tasteless, and lethal. Immediately afterward, I would start thinking, why did he want to know that? And I, <laughs> I got cautious. I went up and I double locked the side door that led into my laboratory. And I informed the members of my family that no one was to go into my lab, to keep everybody out, and especially to keep Joe out. Unfortunately, it didn't work. My younger sister was at home a week, two weeks later, perhaps, and Joe showed up at the house and sweet-talked her into letting him into my laboratory because he had to sterilize some instruments. To clean up some instruments here. Two weeks later, June arrived at Joe's house for their son's fifth birthday party. He offered her a drink, and she stayed for about two hours. Here you are. Oh, thank you. During the time that she was at Joe's for the party, she had called up, and she was kind of like wound up, different than when she left. And I had asked her, how many drinks did you have? And she says, Wanda, I only had two. So she went to her apartment, and a little while later, I went over to check on her. And I asked her if she wanted me to stay with her. She said, no, she said she, that was not necessary. You know, she, she was didn't feel quite well, and she was going to go to bed. It's food poisoning. The next morning, Wanda was surprised to find Joe and a doctor in the hall outside of June's apartment. Uh, is everything all, all right here? Uh, June isn't feeling too well, so I called the doctor over. She's going to be fine. I think I'll go check on her. No. And when I went in to check on June, hi, June. She was there, and we were in the bedroom talking. And she didn't want me to leave her alone with Joe. 
She wanted me to stay with her. That was quite definite. She wanted me to stay with her. So I did. So what did the doctor say? He said he thought it was food poisoning, but I think it's something else. All of a sudden, she stopped, and it was like a, a almost a, I would almost have to say a fear look in her eyes. And I looked over, and Joe was standing in the doorway. The next day, June lapsed into a coma and was immediately hospitalized. Despite a series of tests, doctors found no cause for her rapid decline. You don't think she's going to make it? Joe Maloney seemed unconcerned about his wife's condition. He suggested that she might have tried to commit suicide over their separation. I didn't think she would commit suicide, but I was afraid that somehow they would make it look like that. June never regained consciousness. Her autopsy revealed that she had ingested a lethal dose of the same type of chemical that Joe had taken from Neil's lab. Four hours after his wife's death, Joe Maloney was arrested and charged with first-degree murder. Maloney asked to be committed to the Rochester State Mental Hospital for psychiatric evaluation. The court granted his request. What the judge didn't know was that Maloney had once worked at the hospital and was familiar with the layout. Less than two weeks after being admitted, Joe Maloney escaped and disappeared. Five years later, and more than 3,000 miles away, in Dublin, Ireland, authorities were called to investigate a burglary at the home of a Mr. Michael O'Shea. The police apparently already knew uh, Michael O'Shea. He didn't have any criminal record in Ireland. There was no allegation of, of criminal wrongdoing on his part. They were looking for the burglar's prints. All the people who were in the house obviously weren't the burglar. Um, so they wanted to be able to eliminate uh, those prints from the prints taken. Do you mind if we check the mantelpiece and the desk for fingerprints? He allowed him to take his fingerprints. Well, this detective went right into his office and sent it into Interpol. And he had a hit. Michael O'Shea's fingerprints matched Joseph Maloney's. Joseph Maloney could not be arrested because Ireland and the United States had no extradition agreement. But after 13 years, that law was changed. Maloney was finally taken into custody, but he was still denying his true identity. While in jail, the suspect refused to cooperate with the authorities and did not allow himself to be photographed. Two years after his arrest, the Irish-American extradition treaty was voided because of a legal technicality. Maloney walked out of prison and disappeared, perhaps forever. Joseph Maloney was born in 1935. This is a sketch of what he might look like today. He is six feet, two inches tall, with a slender build. Maloney has reddish-colored hair and blue eyes with a scar over the right eyebrow. Authorities believe he may have fled to Canada. If you have any information, please log on to our website at unsolved.com. Next, a young woman vanishes and police suspect a personal ad may have led to her abduction. Eighteen-year-old Kristen Motaferi was a college honor student from North Carolina spending the summer in San Francisco. On Monday, June 23rd, she arrived for work at the Crocker Galleria Mall. She had taken a job at a coffee shop to pay for a photography course at UC Berkeley. Hey, Mike, how's it going? Good morning. How are you? She wanted to come to the big city and find some excitement. But it seemed to be coupled with a, a naivete or not a real understanding of how the big city works. 
At the end of her shift, Kristen left the coffee shop, then disappeared without a trace. From the start, authorities were frustrated by intriguing clues that went nowhere and a trail that led directly into the ocean. The mystery was a nightmare not only for police, but also for her parents. Just got to the hotel. Yeah, we're here. The day after Kristen vanished, her parents flew immediately to San Francisco. When we found out that she had disappeared, we were just shocked. We couldn't eat. We, we barely spoke. Uh, we just were just even having trouble breathing. When you uh, are faced with a situation like this, you really don't know how strong you can be. You can either crawl in a hole and die and give up, or you can fight. There was no choice for us. We were going to fight for our daughter. As in many missing persons cases, police had few leads to work with. You don't have a crime scene. You have no witnesses. You can't even establish that a crime has occurred. And you just kind of build on little pieces of information, hunches, whatever you can come up with, and see if you can uh, put the puzzle together. One of the first pieces of the puzzle was identifying a blonde woman seen with Kristen the day she disappeared. 45 minutes after Kristen's shift ended, a man who worked with her noticed them at the mall together. He thought that was kind of strange because she never really stuck around after work. As soon as she checked out, she was gone. They were hanging out together, talking together, definitely with each other. So we made a lot of effort to try to get the blonde woman to come forward, identify herself, and we appealed a number of times through the media, but never got a response. Police used a bloodhound to try to retrace Kristen's route the day she vanished. When we were downtown, I could tell he was on a trail. He knew exactly where he was going. Every turn was perfect. But police weren't sure if this was a route Kristen took the day that she disappeared or some other day. He then led us up to Geary Street, heading out towards Land's End Beach. Kristen's co-workers said that on the day she vanished, she talked about visiting Land's End Beach. We then got down to the beach area and came to a point where the trail seemed to have stopped. It's a very treacherous part of the San Francisco waterline. Numerous people each year are washed off the rocks and uh, are never seen again. So that was a distinct possibility that she had, in fact, uh, fallen into the ocean. We really don't believe that's what happened to Kristen. It's a very tourist-oriented area. There's always people around. If she had fallen into the water, uh, somebody would have seen something. If Kristen didn't drown, then what happened to her? ABC 7. 17 days after Kristen vanished, a man called the local news station. He said Kristen had been murdered. Okay, how do you know these two women? He went into a very long description of who he said killed her. And he told me that there were two women, and he named them. And he said that Kristen had been killed as a result of a lesbian love affair that went wrong. Detectives tracked down the two women named by the caller, but determined that they didn't know Kristen and had nothing to do with her disappearance. We then asked these people, who has a grudge against you? Who would? want to see you go through this. Both women named the same person, a man we'll call Ryan. All right, so I made the phone call, so what? Ryan told police the two women were his girlfriend's employers. He claimed that they were harassing her at work. To get back at them, he said that he phoned in the false tip. But the police suspected that there was more to Ryan's story. They investigated his background and found allegations that he had abused women in the past. The next step was to see if he had any connection to Kristen. Police say that Ryan met women mostly through personal ads. There it is, right here. I bet you this one's it. Check it out. Earlier, they had found an ad in Kristen's apartment they think she might have placed. If you read it, 
Sounds like it could be Kristen. It's, it's all the kind of things she was interested in. Photography, walking the city, music, art. It was all the kind of things that uh, Kristen was there to do. Another clue was found at the home of Ryan's girlfriend. Her diary was missing several pages. Pages covering the same time period Kristen had been in San Francisco. She told police Ryan had torn out the pages. We asked her, why is this the way it is? And uh, she would said that some of the stuff that was in there could come back to hurt him. Still, police say they have no clear evidence that Ryan was involved in Kristen's disappearance. Ryan says that he passed a polygraph test given by a reputable expert. He agreed to be interviewed on the condition that we would not show his face and that we change his voice. I never met Kirsten. I never saw her. There's absolutely no connection to Kirsten and I in any way. And what I did was wrong. I wish I never made that call. Police have completely cleared Ryan as a suspect. With no new leads, the case is now back at square one. For Kristen's parents, the search for answers continues. We owe this to her, we owe this to ourselves, and we owe this to her sisters. Someone stole Kristen's dreams, and uh, that's not fair. Kristen Moraferi is five feet, eight inches tall, and weighs 140 pounds. She has brown hair and brown eyes. There is a $50,000 reward being offered in this case. If you have any information, please log on to our website at unsolved.com. Next, a girl is nearly killed in a brutal attack. Was the intended target actually her boyfriend? Carlsbad, California. 16-year-old Jenny Pratt had hopes of becoming a model. She was pretty popular and a sophomore at a local high school. But what mattered most to Jenny was her boyfriend, Curtis Croft. Curtis drove a Porsche, had plenty of money, and was a good-looking surfer. As far as Jenny's parents knew, he was only a year older than Jenny. He looked 17. And further on down the road, I found out, you know, he had been in jail for drugs, and um, he was 24 years old, and just bad news for a 16-year-old kid. Against her parents' wishes, Jenny went out with Curtis one April night. He borrowed a friend's motorcycle and promised Jenny that he would get her back before her midnight curfew. Jenny never made it home. Jenny Pratt was brutally attacked with an unusual weapon, a heavy board six and a half feet long. Police believe the assailants were local teenagers, and Jenny's parents hope that someone will finally find the courage to step forward and identify her attackers. On the night of the attack, Jenny's parents received a call that their daughter had been airlifted to a nearby hospital. They said, your daughter's been in an accident. I said, is she OK? And they wouldn't tell me anything. And they said, you know, you'll have to come down. Scripps Medical Center in La Jolla, California, takes only the most severe cases. Can we see her? Jenny's parents were given the worst possible news. Your daughter is brain dead. <laughs> and we don't expect her to live but two the blow from the board that struck her was great enough to actually crush the skull. And that caused an immediate uh, shutdown of her brain. And then they said, I could see her. And what I saw was horrible. Her hair was red from all the blood. She was bleeding out of her nose, her ears, her mouth. She had tubes all over her. And it was like her whole body was just distorted. Jenny survived, but she lapsed into a deep coma. Our first uh, involvement in the case was to examine the evidence that was found at the crime scene, which consisted 
of the 2x4 that was used to, to hit Jenny and Curtis. So we examined that for physical evidence and didn't find any fingerprints. There were some blood stains on it, which uh, were determined to be Jenny's. Curtis was interviewed that same day at the Carlsbad Police Station. His account of what happened uh, basically is that he was giving Jennifer a ride home. They were driving down Rancho Santa Fe Road, getting to, ready to make a left turn. It's just like going, just approaching the intersection, going real pretty slow. And all of a sudden, something struck me, and I just go, "Ow, oh, what was that?" It's like it just kind of hurt really bad. And then the car, the car went zooming by, and I went back, I turned around, tell Jenny, I "Go, someone threw something at me or something." You know, I don't know what happened. Something hit me. I'm just like, you know, I couldn't believe it. It hurt, and she was out of it. And so I just go, "Oh my God, what's happening?" We believed it was a case where a car load or a truck load of juveniles had committed this crime. Curtis was giving Jennifer a ride home. They had almost come to a complete stop when he realized that he had been struck by a board and realized that Jenny had been struck by a board and had slumped against him. At the same time, a white pickup truck went by them at a high rate of speed. He had the impression that there was a large group of juveniles in the back of the pickup truck, that they were laughing as they went by, and his impression was that the board came flying from the pickup truck. Quite frankly, we expected it to be a crime that would have been solved just by the nature of juveniles to have a tendency to talk. But to this date, we have yet to have anybody come up and supply us with any direct knowledge of what happened that night. I understand you're a friend of Jennifer Pratt. Jenny's yes, parents hired a private investigator who interviewed yeah. students at Jenny's high yeah. school. Basically, all I can tell you is at that night that happened, it was not aimed for Denny, it was aimed for Curtis, and nobody know, really knows who did it. I have a feeling I know who did it, but no one's really willing to say. There's no doubt that there were people, because of Curtis's background, that didn't like him. He was not a popular person. Two years before the attack, Curtis had been convicted of dealing cocaine. By cooperating with the police, he served less than half of his sentence. He developed a reputation as a snitch when he got himself in trouble. And uh, young people, particularly young people involved in drugs, tend to look down on somebody who develops that reputation. Police investigated several people who might have had a grudge against Curtis. Hey, get out here! They learned that he had confronted one of his enemies on the night before the attack. The other night. I didn't see anything from your apartment. Yeah, you did. You know exactly what I'm talking about, too. You know, Jenny's like parents Roman believe did. that that boy might have attacked yeah. Curtis and Jenny yeah. because of the argument. To get you. Good. Yeah. According to Curtis, the white pickup truck was traveling too fast for him to see the attackers. He said it went by at about 55 miles an hour. Private investigator Louis Crisafi didn't believe Curtis. Krasafi reconstructed the incident at two different speeds. And we used the identical pickups uh, as far as the model year and the size and the same type of motorcycle, and we used the same conditions. The first reconstruction was done at 50 miles an hour. At that speed, it seems almost certain that both Curtis and Jenny would have here. been killed. They were traveling exactly at 50. There is no way it could have happened the way he says. In this reconstruction, the board fell about 50 feet from the scene of the crime. But after the accident, police found the board only a few feet from the spot where Jenny was attacked. The second reconstruction played out at only 10 miles an hour. It inflicted injuries very similar to the ones that Curtis and Jenny actually received. Exactly what happened. And this time, the board fell right next to the motorcycle. We had reason to believe that Curtis was not telling the whole truth. We went back to Curtis's apartment and visited with him. Krasafi felt that Curtis did see the people in the pickup truck. Krasafi pressed him for more information. Were you in a fight that evening in the restaurant? Finally, Curtis named names. One of them was the same boy that he had fought with on the night before the attack. They like forced me to tell. They, like it's like threatening someone, you know, and they like scared me into saying that, and that wasn't right. Hear what those statements were. Later on, Curtis recanted, telling police that he had given them the names because he felt pressured. 
the truck went by really fast. You know, people try to say, oh, maybe saw someone, but I really didn't. And we've done lion detector tests on me. I've passed everything, you know, I've told the truth. I've always been there to help. I've never, you know, not came around. I've always came to everything he's wanted me to do and cooperated with everything. We do believe that Curtis did, in fact, see those people. Curtis continuously told us that he has been threatened, that uh, he has uh, basically informed on people before and was very, very frightened that he would be killed and he was already being threatened not to talk in this case. And we have reason to believe that what he's saying to that effect is true. Hi, Jen. It's Mommy. How you doing? Three months after the attack, Jenny Pratt came out of her coma. At first, she seemed incapable of thought or action. But after 12 weeks, she started physical therapy. Seven months later, Jenny began to speak. A year later, she walked. Why was somebody mad at me? What did I do to them to hurt them? We need somebody in the community with half the courage of Jennifer Pratt. Somebody who just knows the one missing link, the one thing that'll tie this whole case together, because I really think that's all we're missing, is a one small link, and someone out there has it. If you have any information about this case, please log on to our website at unsolved.com. Next, a boy separated from his foster mother is reunited with her after 30 years. And a man dreams that his mother is in a life or death struggle with a prison inmate. And then the struggle really happens. May 7th, 1964, Queens, New York. Gene and Don Warren greet the newest member of their family, a two-year-old foster child named Roger Lindsley. Hello, Roger. Hello. Hello, Roger. Hello. I fell in love with him immediately. There was something about him that drew me to him. And I said to myself, this is going to be my son. I think adjusting in our family was the best thing for Roger. Whatever we did, he was there with us. And each day, I was loving this child more and more and more. Three years after Roger arrived, Jean and her husband had to move to Ohio. They were heartbroken to learn that they could not take Roger with them. When she took him to the car, he looked at us and looked at me, and I remember putting out his hand and crying, I don't want to go, I don't want to go. You'd be a good boy, Roger. I could only say, Roger, be good. Take care of yourself, and I love you, and I'll always remember you. Jean Warren always remembered Roger and never gave up hope that she would see him again. Date. On the night of our broadcast, we received a call from a very excited Roger Lindsley. And then another surprise. We heard from a man named James Lindsley, who turned out to be Roger's long lost brother. 30 years after they were separated, Roger finally came home to the woman he still calls mom. Hi. Are handsome. Thank you. How are you? I'm fine. <laughs> I was ecstatic. So beautiful. My heart started pounding. I would like him and his wife to be a part of our family. And uh, it's so nice to hear him call me mom. That makes it all worthwhile. Hi, Wendy. <laughs> I feel so much love for that woman. She has changed my life. I got a family overnight. Overnight, I got a family. And uh, I'm, a, I'm a happy man. Here. These are the pictures <laughs> of your life of the three years that you spent with us. Three beautiful Next, years. Roger's okay, brother sorry. James arrived. They were separated as infants and hadn't seen each other in nearly three decades. Hey. Hey, Roger, how you What's doing, happening? 
Where you been, huh? That's unbelievable. There's no feeling in the world you could imagine. It's not to have a family and then 30 years later in your life you see somebody that's like you is indescribable. I'm overwhelmed. I really am. I found my foster mother. I found my brother. I, did, I couldn't see leaving this world without knowing where I came from. And now I know. When a man named Thomas Wright awoke from a disturbing dream, two questions weighed on his mind. Do nightmares come true? Can prayer be answered? Thomas would soon learn that in his case, the surprising answer to both questions was yes. I could see my mother's squad car. There was a struggle. I saw the person take my mother's gun. It was a woman. I remember the gun moving back and forth, and it looked like my mother really wasn't winning the struggle. She needed help. <laughs> and that was the most disturbing thing about the whole dream was the fact that I didn't know who was shot and why. The only thing I could think of at that point was that there was a possibility that my mother might have been taken away from me. On a September night, Thomas Wright had a nightmare about his mother who worked as a deputy sheriff. It was so troubling that he sat in bed and prayed for her. The bond Thomas shared with his mother had always been especially strong. A lot of different things have just really brought us close to where we're just best friends, really and we can feel each other's hurts anytime. And I didn't know until later why I had the dream. The day after Thomas's nightmare, his mother was transferring a prisoner to a facility two hours away. The inmate was serving a one-year sentence for writing bad checks. As they traveled near Ladonia, Missouri, events took place just as they had in the nightmare. As the car was driving on the highway, I could see my mother talking to the woman who was in, in back. It was almost as if I was sitting in the front seat, but I really wasn't there. At 6 p.m., the squad car stopped. Oh! What are you doing? The convict had small hands, which she managed to slip out of the handcuffs. Doris had to fight for her gun and her life. And I could see my mother's expression. It was almost as if the, the life had just gone from her face. She needed help. Constrained by her seatbelt, Doris was losing. And that's when the events began to differ from Thomas's dream. Out of nowhere, two men suddenly appeared. They managed to distract Doris's attacker. She let go of her hold on the gun. Was it just coincidence that the Good Samaritans came by, or was some mysterious force at work? If I wouldn't have prayed, what would have been the outcome of the events? Would those two men, would they have been there to help her? I really think they're really responsible for saving my mother's life. By the time Doris regained her composure, the two men had driven off. She never had a chance to thank them for their help. I was absolutely convinced that I would die that day. I looked for the men that were there. I wanted to talk to them, wanted to get their names, wanted to thank them for what they had done for me. I want them to know because of their courage and their willingness to help another person. 
I'm still here today. Thomas and his mother would like to thank the people who came to Doris's rescue, but there are few clues. A person who stopped at the scene took this photo of the men's vehicle, a dark blue Chevy CK pickup truck with tinted windows and an extended cab. It was towing a blue and white boat. The two men were driving near Ladonia in Northeast Missouri when they jumped out of their truck to help. It was on Highway 19, about 50 miles from Mark Twain Lake. If you have any information about this case, please log on to our website at unsolved.com. Next, he lived a solitary and simple life. And when he died, he left $200,000, but his heirs are unknown. Walter Green, nicknamed Curly, lived a quiet, frugal life alone in a small apartment near downtown. How are you doing? He was friendly to his neighbors, but kept mostly to himself. One spring day, Curly had a heart attack and died while working in his yard. Everyone who knew Curly was surprised to find out that he had left an inheritance of more than $200,000 worth over a half a million dollars today. But Curly didn't leave a will, and his relatives could not be located. When it came out in the papers that he had the amount of money that they said he had, we were shocked. I can't imagine how he amassed that amount. They found stock certificates, I understand. They found the coin collection. And they found, much to everyone's surprise, that Curly actually owned the apartment building where he was living. It is extraordinary that a man who lived as simply as Curly Green could have accrued such a large sum of money. It is even more extraordinary that the money remains unclaimed. Much of Curly's early life is a mystery, but we do know that when he was only 16, he hopped the train heading for Omaha. Curly jumped off outside the city near a small farming town named Schuyler. He began looking for work. Al Rominger, a local tavern keeper, offered him a ride and a home-cooked meal with his family. Catherine, the younger of the two Rominger girls, was only nine years old. I don't know why Dad brought him home. We supposed he came from Denver. We were curious when he set the table, because we'd never seen him before. But he was a nice-looking young man. At dinner, Curly didn't say much about his family or his birthplace in Montana. He had a very nice way of evading. See, when Mama asked him, said, didn't you have some cousins or something? He just said, well, I did once. And he changed the subject. And that's the way Curly was and we respected him for it. Do you have any brothers or sisters? Well, none as pretty as your daughters, ma'am. From the moment Curly first saw Catherine's older sister, Jessamine, he was in love. He would never feel the same way about anyone else. Al Rominger found Curly a job working at the local garage. He earned enough to move into a boarding house. Now that he was a working man, Curly began to court Jessamine. Curly thought quite a bit of Jessamine because he never went with other girls, only Jessamine. When the United States entered the First World War, Curly enlisted in the Army. After serving on the European front, he returned home to Schuyler and to Jessamine. There's Jessamine here. No, Curly, I'm sorry. He's gone to Omaha. Jessamine liked him, and he was a gentleman always. But she wanted other things out of life. And he didn't appear to be educated. And his earning capacity wasn't great, I suppose. Curly followed Jessamine to Omaha, but she ended up marrying another man. Curly never married or had a family of his own. 
he spent the next 60 years alone. In that time, he never talked about his family. Over the years, Curley saved a considerable fortune. Some suspect that the money came from the sale of his rare coin collection. But Catherine thought he just saved every penny he ever made. Well, he said he would get up in the morning, and after he'd eat breakfast, he'd put a can on the pilot light. And by the time he'd come back and ready for lunch or the evening meal, it was just right to eat. He was that saving. Maybe that's how he got the money. When he died, Curly left behind more than $200,000 in real estate, stocks and bonds, and cash. So far, no legitimate heirs have claimed the estate. Investigator Josh Butler tracks down missing heirs professionally. He has researched the case of Curly Grain, but hasn't found anyone yet. It's very strange that a man would accumulate $200,000 in his lifetime and that he would have no known relatives uh, that anybody knew about and not leave some sort of a written document concerning the disposition of this money. But somewhere there's somebody who has enough information in their own family that they're going to be able to come forward and uh, prove their entitlement to this. These are five of the few known photographs of Curly Green, showing him as a young man, in middle age, and before he died. He said that he was born in Kendall, Montana, and lived in Denver. He was known to have a collection of gold coins, some of which he might have obtained in Mexico. Apparently, he once received postcards from someone in Brooklyn, New York. Curly claimed he had a brother who was killed in a shootout. He stated that his father, Albert Harry Green, was born in England. His mother, Anne Morin Green, was born in Latvia. Neither of Curly's parents have been found. If you have any information about Curly, please log on to our website at unsolved.com.